Lady Glen Connor uh, has been a friend of the royal family for, for a long, long time. Um, maid of honour at the Queen's coronation, lady in waiting to uh, Princess Margaret for, for a, a long time too. She's had a fascinating, fascinating life. Um, this book is a, a memoir about her life, her friendship with um, Princess Margaret, her marriage and so much more. Since then, uh, this was a huge bestseller. Since then, Lady Glen Connor has written two brilliant, compelling novels, um, and it's been a really wonderful, successful, exciting time in Lady Clan Connor's life, so I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing all about that. Less from me, even if you can hear me, and more from my next guest, Lady Clan Connor. Here we go. Shh. Well, where, where can you start? <laughs> well, where would you like to start? I want to start, first yes. things first... Oh, not at the game. Well, I want to start um, by asking you what you thought of the Jubilee last weekend. Well, I thought it was absolutely wonderful. I'm sure you all did. It was so wonderful to see the Queen, who did manage to come on the balcony twice. And, of course, it brought back so many memories for me, because um, at the coronation, which actually uh, we uh, celebrate next year, people think that the coronation was this year, but it wasn't. We celebrate it next year. Um, and the wonderful thing about it was I was attached to the Queen for the whole day. So wherever she went, I went with the other girls. And I, shall I start and say when I first met them? Yes, do. When well, did you first meet them? Yes, because my, um, uh, my father, I'm going to stand up actually. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but I, uh, I, 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 uh, what, what I love is this wonderful audience like this. I mean, it's really lovely. And I can then see you all and you can see me, so I'm going to stand up. Uh, now, my father was an equerry to the Duke of York. Uh, before he became king. And uh, they were great, great friends of the Queen Mother and the King. And as a result, uh, my sister and I saw quite a lot of uh, Princess Elizabeth and Princess Margaret Rose. Um, I think I was three when I first saw them. They came to Holcombe, and I remember uh, being photographed with them. And I just took one look at Princess Margaret, and she took one look at me. And we realised that we were both rather naughty. <laughs> and we had the most wonderful time. We had little tricycles. And at Holcomb, we used to trike up and down the passages, those who, who've been there. Uh, but what we were not allowed to do was bicycle in the hall, the marble hall. Of course we went in there. And I remember... <laughs> Suddenly seeing the Queen, who was about, um, she, she was older, she was about six or seven, and she was playing with the Ogilvy, the Ogilvy boys. She came down, she said, what are you doing, Margaret? Very, very naughty. What are you doing, Anne? And I remember we screamed with laughter, went one more round and then out of the door. <laughs> um, and, and she was just sort of magical. And, and we were friends, really, all our lives. Um, and even more so when uh, I became a lady in waiting. But um, I, people say, what was a queen like, you know? And she was, I admired her very much. Even at that age, she was, um, you know, quite serious. Um, always looking out for Princess Margaret to see Princess Margaret's OK. Um, and we used to go to their birthday parties and Christmas parties. And I remember going to Buckingham Palace. Um, and in those days, we were all dressed in little frilly dresses. And, of course, I had my famous silver shoes on because in one of the photographs, Princess Margaret's looking at my feet. <laughs> and long after, I said, why are you looking at my feet, ma'am? Well, she said, I'm so jealous. You had silver shoes and I had brown lace-ups. <laughs> um, anyway, we went to these wonderful parties. Our nannies, you know, they used to wear hats and gloves and stand behind our chairs. And we had tiny little sandwiches and little cakes and all that sort of thing. And then afterwards, we had us, which actually turned out Princess Margaret hated, and I was terrified, a Punch and Judy show. And so we sat there with our hands over our faces. And then when we left, there was a big table in the hall of Buckingham Palace, on which there were presents. And my sister, who was younger, saw the most lovely teddy bear and raced over and got the teddy bear. And I saw the most beautiful doll. And so I was just about to you know, get the doll, when suddenly I realised Queen Mary was behind the table. And she said, Anne, can I give you a bit of advice? Well, I didn't really want any advice, but anyway, <laughs> I, 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 had to say, I had to say, OK, ma'am. Um, I didn't say okay, actually. I didn't think one said okay. 
Um, and she um, said, well, quite often, better things come in little boxes. Um, and if I were you, I should have... So I didn't want a little box at all, but anyway, I, 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 I took it. And she's quite right, because in the box was a, a pearl and coral necklace, which my great-granddaughter, Ruby, wore at Christmas. Aww. So, uh, you know, she's quite right about that. And then, of course, the war came, and we didn't see the, the uh, princesses were at Windsor. We were sent up to Scotland. But we did, I remember, go over to Glam's once. And that's what gave me the idea, actually, of my book, Haunting at Holcombe. Because, of course, there are, um, there are ghosts at Glam's. And I remember Princess Margaret saying, look how I am, there's a grey lady with no tongue. <laughs> and, and she may easily come. And I said, well, do, do you think we could go in and have a look? And of course, Princess Margaret far too far. And she said, no, no, I, I think, think not. I think that would be a great mistake. And then we went, I remember, at the bottom of the garden, there was a bridge, and the, the local uh, train came through. And I remember standing there with the Queen, Princess Margaret, and my sister, and we were sort of covered in steam as, as the train went underneath it. And then um, I didn't really see them because in those days, Princess Margaret came out and she was sort of very dashing. And my husband, Colin, was one of her sort of young men, her group. And you didn't, I was two years younger and we didn't really meet um, very much for one stuck in one's age group. Um, and it, it was really uh, not until she got married and said to Colin, um, can we come and visit Musty? We're going to be in the Caribbean on the um, Britannia. And I remember Colin and I had been there for several months, and we suddenly saw the Britannia. So it was nearly as big as the island, actually. <laughs> and then in a little beautiful little white boat, off got the uh, captain, I think, and one or two others, and they came ashore with a letter from Princess Margaret saying, we'd love you to come to dinner tonight. So I wrote a letter back and said, look, ma'am, we loved you, but we haven't had a bath for three months. We absolutely stink. <laughs> and I don't think you would actually like to see us, you know. We're not sort of at all. Anyway, <laughs> back came a message said, no, I will put a cabin at your disposal and a bath. And I think it was the most wonderful bath I've ever had, <laughs> lying in the Britannia, you know. And uh, then, of course, you know, Colin said to her, would you like, ma'am, something in a little box? Or would you like a piece of land? And she said that to Tony too, actually. Um, oh, I'd love a piece of land, she said. And then <laughs> not, we heard nothing uh, until her marriage started you know, to go wrong. And uh, she rang up and said, did you mean it? Have I got a bit of land? And can I come out? And I said, no, ma'am, you can't come out. I mean, we've got no electric light, no hot water. We live in a sort of porter cabin thing. Um, I really don't think it's suitable. I'm coming, she said. Uh, and she was wonderful. She adored every minute. We, we, I, I dressed her in Connie's pyjamas because of the mosquitoes, <laughs> tied uh, the, the pyjamas uh, with string. Uh, and she didn't look too good, but funny enough, she, she, well, she wasn't vain. I mean, I would have minded looking like that. Not a bit of it, she strode around, and we took her up on a tractor, and Colin had put all the um, things to measure what, how big the piece of land was. And of course, we suddenly saw taking them up and disappearing. Colin said, what are you doing? Well, I think I need a bit more land, she said. <laughs> and so Colin said, well, what for? Well, she said, which I suppose is true, I need um, uh, somewhere for my securities to, to live. And, of course, she built the house with Colin's help. And um, it, it was the only th place she owned, actually, because she didn't own our house in Kensington Palace. Um, and she absolutely loved it. And one of the sort of nice things, sort of when one thinks when I saw the Queen the other day on the balcony, and I always remember... She, they, she said she wanted to come to Mustique and to see Princess Margaret's house. And she was so sweet. I mean, she um, was thrilled, and Princess Margaret was just thrilled. I mean, she saw everything. The Queen said, I've seen every lavatory in Margaret's house, she said. <laughs> um, and, and in the kitchen, she was saying everything. And the, the Duke of Edinburgh, 
of course, being the Duke of Edinburgh, when he landed, he looked round and said to Colin, I can see you've ruined this island. And, and Colin was terribly upset. Anyway, I slightly got my own back. I said, well, actually, sir, um, very exciting for you. We've arranged for you to swim with sharks. And he, did, he didn't say anything. I didn't say anything. In fact, it was some rather interesting thing that happens every um, three weeks in the year when the mother shark uh, uh, goes into a bay and gives birth, and you can sort of uh, swim around and see them doing this. And actually, as you can remember, when he uh, said goodbye, he said, I really, really love your island. But I have one more story about Busty, which I think the one or two people here in the audience who are related to Colin's mother. <laughs> well, Colin's, Colin was very, very eccentric, and so was his mother. I, I always remember once when I first married to Colin, I thought I just simply couldn't go on. I mean, you know, I never met anybody like this. And all the sort of temper tantrums, he said, that's the minute we were married, Anne, I won't need to lose my temper. Well, I don't know why I believe that, but I... <laughs> anyway, uh, I was on my last... I was really, really sort of worried, so I said to his mother, you know, is there anything I can do uh, to help? Because, you know, he blows up and all this thing. And, and all she said, well, darling, all he needs is a nice cup of cocoa every night. <laughs> so I said, I'd rather doubt that would help. <laughs> but anyway, um, for the Queen's visit, um, it was very, very difficult to get um, clothes in Musty for, for, the, for the local people. You couldn't get anything nice. And so he asked his mother to buy some things in England and bring them out um, and so that we could give them to the people in the village. So it was very exciting. Uh, the, my my mother-in-law and these boxes arrived on a boat called the Geisy Darling. And uh, anyway, we started, we opened them to absolute horror. She bought a job lock of Victorian clothes. <laughs> and anyway, when I said to the villagers, I said to Colin, you know, we've got to say that this is what you wear when the Queen comes. Uh, and so they were thrilled, actually. Uh, and I, 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 the, the women I've managed to, to do up, you know, the bone thing, the men have stone pipe hats. I showed them how to curtsy, how to bow. And, I, and then we got chairs, and the Queen was arriving um, on the key and was going to walk up and of course they none of them moved they were so so amazed I mean I think they also they thought she would be wearing a crown I suppose <laughs> uh, and uh, anyway when the Queen got up she said to Princess Margaret I've no idea that Musty was in a Victorian time walk <laughs> <laughs> and so Princess Margaret said well it isn't it is Colin's mother and when I said to her um, pa Pamela, she was lovely actually. I said, but wh why did you? Oh, she says, it was so much more fun having them in a Victorian clothes. <laughs> So, well, perhaps you've done last week. Can, you, can you tell us more about your most vivid memories of the of the coronation? Oh, yeah, well, I can easily do that. Mm. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> people always say, what is, was the most marvellous day of your life? And I'm afraid I always say the coronation. <laughs> and they say, well, wasn't your wedding? And I said, well, it, it was different. But uh, <laughs> Well, I was very, very lucky because I was... Um, uh, my mother started a pottery at Holcombe. And uh, I um, was not very artistic and was rather grumpy. I think I used to do something called sponging and fettling, most boring job in the world, and uh, got grumpy. And my mother said, no, no, Anne, what would you like to do? You know, come on, cheer up. And so I said, well, I, I, I like to sell. I've always heard that thing. So I went off, and I was the only woman uh, uh, travelling salesman. I used to uh, stay in all these travelling salesman hotels, and they were amazed. You know, and in those days, the hotels were smelt of cabbage, and there was one light. And the, the men all uh, were quite stuffy because there was no proper uh, way of washing things or, you know, all that sort of thing. Anyway, uh, and um, I used to w wait in d downstairs reading my book. And when the trolley came at nine with sort of cocoa and that sort of thing, they, they, they always said, um, will you be mother? So at a very young age, I was only uh, just 17. Anyway, I went to America and that went all over America, was in New York when I got a telegram from my mother. In those days, telegrams generally uh, were about somebody who died mm. or, or some awful news. I remember opening it, sort of, and 
in it, she said, Anne, you must come home. The Queen has asked you to be a maid of honor at her coronation, which was so thrilling. So off I went, and of course I saw a mass of pottery because it got into the New York Times. <laughs> and I had rather hideous sort of Toby jugs of the Queen of New Edinburgh. Anyway, they all went. And I remember my mother meeting me uh, when I uh, stepped off the Queen Mary, I was on the Queen Mary, waving my order book, you know, I was so, so thrilled. And then, um, of course, we were drilled. The Duke of Norfolk, who had um, overseen uh, the king's coronation before the war, uh, at which the queen had been. And I'm sure that she'd taken in a lot while she's watching her father being crowned. And we didn't do much practice with her, hardly at all, only once at Buckingham Palace, where she sort of tied a, a curtain around our middle, and we wandered up and down <laughs> going. Uh, but we were always um, practicing with the Duchess of Norfolk. Um, and th that was fine. We ha I mean, he drilled us. We were like soldiers. We knew exactly what to do. And the other sort of thrill was going to Norman Hartnell and seeing our dresses, because in the war, you know, the coupons, you either had a pair of shoes, and as my feet seemed to grow alarmingly, it was always <laughs> I had to have a pair of shoes, you know, instead of a skirt or anything. And so to go to Norman Hartle to see these beautiful dresses, and the silk had come from Wales, uh, that was uh, the, the silk worms for some reason, lived in Wales. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 they were extremely busy because they made enough for the Queen and our dresses. And they were beautifully embroidered in the front and down the back because you, we were seen from the back. Mm. And then we had uh, wreaths of um, pearls and little sort of uh, diamonds and uh, golden leaves, very, very pretty. Long white gloves we had. And we were given a file of smelling salts. Uh, and told that if we felt faint, to wriggle our toes and break the file. Well, among the, uh, the maids of honour was uh, Rosie Churchill, uh, who was splendid. She wasn't a Churchill for nothing. Anyway, long came the uh, Archbishop of Canterbury, and she sort of shook his hand in a rather violent way, broke her file, so <laughs> the most appalling smell. Uh, and he's absolutely furious. He said, what have you done? So, so, uh, and got out his hanky and sort of, went off. So that wasn't actually very good. Uh, and then we were given uh, chairs to sit in, but there were so many men dressed up in armour, uh, that we uh, very old men, and so we felt we had to give our seats to them. But, uh, but, uh, and then four of us, the two grandest ones, Rosie Churchill, the Duke's daughters, went in a carriage behind the Queen, and four of us went to the Abbey, and um, I remember waiting there, it's pouring with rain, and having driven there in the car, I was so lovely because they'd been there, the crowds had been there all night, pouring with rain. And I, I couldn't understand, they kept on saying, Hillary, Hillary. Of course, when we got there, somebody said that Hillary had reached the um, top of Mount Everest. I, I can't understand how he could have got there exactly that morning. Was he waiting in a tent just for, <laughs> in, in order to get to the top? So, you know. But anyway, it's very exciting that he did. And um, we were waiting for her, and we suddenly had her coming. We could hear that sort of roar uh, of, uh, of people. It got louder and louder and louder. And then round the corner came this amazing golden coach, which everybody saw the other day, which was extraordinary, I thought, in, in the pageant, because they, they got us a film of the Queen then, waving out of it. You know, it, was, it was strange sort of looking at it. And then two, pa two pages opened the door. We hadn't seen her in her dress. And she looked absolutely fantastic, most beautiful dress. And of course, she was so young, she was 26, wonderful uh, complexion, eyes, and then this great smile and all the jewelry. Anyway, we helped her out. People said, did she say anything to you then? She, no, she didn't actually. And we got her in position. And the Duke of Norfolk had thought of everything. It was a tiny little bit of cotton he put on the carpet so she knew exactly where to stand. Yeah. And he had a bald head, the Duke of Norfolk, and because he knew the lights, because of being filmed and televised, the lights were really, really strong. And he had somebody following him around with a powder puff, <laughs> powdering his head, so it shouldn't show. He thought of everything. <laughs> uh, and anyway, she, she then, you know, she had our back 
first we had the train came over our hands like that, waiting. And then she just looked round. She said, ready, girls? Aww. And off we went to Nimrod. Uh, and it was like a sort of medieval tapestry. People said, but how did they get so many people into the Abbey? Well, they built it right up, right up to the ceiling. And where the choir stalls were, that was full of uh, people from the Commonwealth who wore their uh, national dress, which was very colourful, because all the peers, peeresses, uh, we were told we had sandwiches and all sorts of things in there. <laughs> okay. And uh, we went through, and I suppose the most moving moment, and the moment that I was so lucky to have seen, was the anointing. Because the Queen had said she hadn't really wanted it to be televised, but the Duke of Norfolk and Churchill, actually, had said it's absolutely got to, you know. Um, I think they were right. But the Queen said, during the anointing, the cameras must be turned off, and they put this um, um, uh, sort of thing over her, um, and so that nobody could see her except the six of us who were standing like that, and she was just there and one of the bishops, obviously. And they took all her regalia away from her and dressed her in this little um, shift, this little linen, white linen dress. And the Marquis of Chumley, the old Marquis of Chumley, very, very beautiful, marvellous man, always with his profile like that, his job was actually to do up this dress from behind, and it had hooks and eyes. Well, he let her, he'd never dressed anybody. He couldn't dress himself, I don't think. <laughs> <laughs> and he was like, the, and the Duke of Norfolk got more and more irritated and said, well, you can't, you, you know. And in the end, uh, they put press stars. So there was uh, the Marquis doing this down the Queen's back. <laughs> and afterwards I said to her, was that okay? And she said, no, it was not okay. She <laughs> said, it was awful. Every time he did that, I thought I was doing this. <laughs> Um, and then, of course, the actual anointing was very, very moving when she gave herself to Great Britain and the Commonwealth and, uh, you know, swore that she uh, uh, would carry on as long as she lived. Because sometimes people say, do you think she'd abdicate? Uh, I'm sure she won't. I mean, she took this oath and she'll keep to it. And then the other thing, when we got back to our King Palace, was to go on the balcony, uh, which was extraordinary. Um, you really couldn't put a pin between it people and the actual I think that he was extra special then because we had just won the war and we've gone through the most awful time in the war frightening I remember I was a child and terrified of, of, of Hitler arriving and you know wondering whether we would win the war and so this is an expression of joy and um, you know this wonderful beautiful young queen uh, beginning of another Elizabethan age um, so, and there we were, and every time she tried to come back inside, they wouldn't let her, they, you know. And you give us flashes in, in your wonderful retelling of the coronation of, of the Queen uh, and what she was saying, or the, you know, being put into her white linen dress or whatever. Do you have any sense of what she really was thinking and feeling through all of this? Can one ever know? Well, well I think it's, no, I think it's a bit different. I mean, as far as we could tell yeah. from the outside, she's very, very calm. Right. Uh, she just knew exactly what to do. She, and I think, um, uh, actually, sort of been thinking a, a bit about that. And I think that um, I, there was a wonderful film the other day I don't know whether you saw it, of old film that the Queen let people have. And in it was a wonderful bit of her with her uncle David. And they looked so happy, I thought. And he was sort of playing with and all that. And I think that was a terrible blow. I think that um, after he abdicated, her, uh, the King, her father, was not well, really, mm. and it hastened his death. And I think that she said, I'm sure she thought to herself, well, I'm never going to do that. I will, you know, and she never has. I mean, she's been absolutely wonderful. Mm. Mm. So, are you happy standing still? Would well, you I'd like, like to sit down, down for, a for a bit? Yes, okay. do. Do you want to sit down? And I do, and have some water. Keel over yes. like I did in the coronation. <laughs> exactly. like, I, I, and I'm sorry I don't have any smelling salts. No, Maybe no, someone no, does. No, well, they didn't help, actually. Oh, well, uh, and go. it was Black Rod who saved me, because I started to sway, and Jane, um, the rain, uh, uh, who's just in front, um, and she could feel me going back and forth. And luckily, Black Rod, who was the most uh, wonderful-looking gentleman, dressed in velvet, 
velvet, black velvet and black silk, um, with a sort of cue, it looked like a billiard cue. Anyway, an eminent um, uh, 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 general in the army won many a battle, and he said, you're my last battle, as he, as he pinned me to the wall. <laughs> Well, let's hope it doesn't come to that. No, well... Um, it wasn't many years after that that you, you got married. Um, uh, not that many, because yeah, you yeah, got so married... Yeah, about, yeah, about six years later. Yes. Yeah. And then you, you, you write um, a lot about your marriage to Colin in the book, um, which was full of, uh, full of challenges and full of joy as well. Um, uh, there, were, there were troubled times in there. Can you tell us a bit about some of the, some of the, most, the, some of the difficult times and some of the happy times? Well, well uh, did you want me to tell... I mean, <laughs> will you tell the honeymoon story? <laughs> there is a story that is both sort of the funniest story you will ever hear and yet at the same time one of the most painful stories you'll ever hear and it's kind of rare to have both well, well, of those I, in I, one. If I you could bear choose, it. Well, I have to choose my audience a bit carefully. But I, I think the is there anyone whose ears you'd like me to block as you tell it? I think it? they've all got a sense of... Well, okay. it was so unexpected, really, because uh, I had this really grand wedding at, at Holcomb, those of you who've been to Holcomb, um, uh, and it's wonderful. Um, what year was this? Uh, that, that was in 56. Okay. And um, it was, uh, you know, I had three wedding cakes because my father was a stickler for sort of convention. Uh, the, there was a tent for the workers, there was a tent for the tenants. There was, uh, the, the, then our friends were in the house. And Tony Sladen took our, well, he wasn't Tony Sladen, he was Tony Armstrong Jones then, mm. uh, took our wedding photographs. And that was the first time he, I think, met Princess Margaret. Uh, although she sort of just said hello, I think. Mm. Um, anyway, with a tremendous wedding, you know, and then we were going to fly to Paris, um, which took a rather long time, because we had to come down somewhere to do our passports outside London. We arrived very, very late at night at the Lotti Hotel and um, went up, we hoped, I mean, I imagined, and Colin is a sort of honeymoon suite, to find two single beds. Well, Colin completely lost his temper, <laughs> raced down, and it was about three o'clock in the morning where this very small man was behind the desk. Um, uh, and I was amazed. There was Colin waving his arms and shrieking and shouting. And so uh, uh, Colin did speak a bit of French and realised that there was a double mattress in the basement. And if Colin helped, they could drag it the whole way up to our bedroom. Well, as they were doing this, everybody came out of their room. It was so embarrassing. And I was still standing there in my silk dress and bag and gloves, waiting for this um, mattress to arrive. The mattress was then flown on the bed. I'm not sure the little man just managed to get out. <laughs> Colin just flung himself onto it and went to sleep. <laughs> and I thought, well, this is terribly disappointing. Well, in those days, because of contraception, everything, none of us really, you know, did sleep. It was very different nowadays, but we, in those days we didn't. So, um, it, it, and then the next day we went to the Louvre, we, we wandered around there, and then Colin said he had a wonderful surprise. So I thought, well, goody, we're going to have dinner at the Ritz. And so I put on my best dress and, uh, you know, and realised actually when the taxis set off that we weren't sort of going in the right direction. And it, it then screeched a halt in front of uh, which turned out to be a brothel, very seedy. We went up where there were two wing-back velvet chairs, which Colin sat in one and I sat in the other. I closed my eyes. Because on the bed were these two people sort of uh, having sex. And um, they kept on saying to me, um, would you like to join in? I was very, I was very, very polite. I said, it was frightfully kind of you, but no, thank you. <laughs> I was just longing for them to stop. We said, thank goodness they did. Uh, and I said to Colin, I, I, oh, he said, I thought, you, you know. But anyway, so that wasn't a very, very what did good he start. Think? What, what, what did he think? Well, I don't know what he what? thought. I, I really don't, but whatever he thought was wrong. I, I, <laughs> and, it, and it didn't work. <laughs> I like you to, in the book where you end this story with, but I was wearing a demure silk dress. <laughs> which does sum, sum it up, you know, the sort of incongruity of, that, of the whole situation. Well, that, of course, the story has legs, actually, because how I really got going, having, because I was 50, 87, when somebody said, um, would you, why don't you write a book? And I thought, well, I can't. I mean, I'm 87. Uh, I don't even have a mobile. I mean, you know, you can only get hold of me with postcards and landline. Uh, and they said, well, dictate it, you know. And in fact, that's what I did. And um, there were the two things I wanted. I said to my publisher, 
I'm determined to sell half a million copies. I've sold a million. Um, <laughs> all, all, all over the world. It's, it's been translated in, I think, 16 languages now. Uh, and um, I want to be on Graham Norton's red sofa. <laughs> Well, they say, no, no, Lady Glencolly, you've got it all wrong. You'll never get on. He doesn't have people uh, with books on. Anyway, I got on. And my, my great friend, uh, Rupert Everett, the actor, I said, now, now I've got on. I'm simply terrified because I'm not coming on until halfway through. So I'm going to be in uh, the green room watching it, which is the most terrifying thing. You know? yeah. And so Rupert said, well, my advice to you, Anne, is... Graham's always full of sexual innuendos. You get in first. Get in first <laughs> with your honeymoon story. My yeah. children, the sitting there, they were all in the audience, poor things. Uh, <laughs> uh, and off I went. Well, Graham, I believe, I didn't see, but his mouth hanging open behind me. <laughs> and Helena Bonham Carter, who was a great friend of mine, was also on, because she played Princess Margaret. And uh, I was talking, I don't know why, we, oh, well, because of the story, talking about brothels. And I said, the one in London used to be run by... A, uh, the upmarket posh one was run by somebody called Mrs. Featherstone Hall. Um, and, uh, you know, so, and so Helen said, oh, really, I've never heard of that. I said, oh, really, because your father was always there. <laughs> <laughs> And so she said, well, she said, are you sure? I said, yes. I mean, Colin used to go. Yes, your father was regular. That's regular. Uh, anyway, so it was all great fun. And when I, when I came off, there was a very nice black actor who sadly has died now. But he came up to me and he said, gee whiz, lady. Uh, and I felt I'd arrived. <laughs> I have watched that clip. I've never seen Graham Norton speechless, but you really did, did, did shut well, him up. Well, I got a million likes, and of course that um, sent me. I've also become like, because it sort of ties in, which I hadn't realised, a gay icon. <laughs> and I, I did, uh, I did something for the Prince's Trust the other day on um, uh, whatever you call it when you speak into on Zoom. Zoom. Yes, Zoom. Right. Zoom. Yeah. <laughs> Zoom. Yeah. Uh, um, I'm learning. So. Um, and they said, would you like to know who sponsored you? So I said, well, yes, I'd love to. Well, it's the gay community in Milwaukee. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know where Milwaukee was. But I, and now they started to come over. To, to, I live in uh, North Norfolk. And uh, it's lovely. I mean, they write to me anyway. A group of them came over the other day. And uh, 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 for some reason, they always stay in the Jolly Sailor. <laughs> <laughs> Which, which is a, a pub that we're quite near. And in, in some ways it's come full circle. So after, since you wrote Lady in Waiting, you've written two novels. And you, you mention in the book that your mother named you after the H.G. Wells novel. Yeah, yes, Anne I am Veronica. Veronica, So yes. it's sort of come, yes. it's come as though you always had novels in you somehow. Well, I don't, I don't think, I'm not sure I did. No. <laughs> well, I, I mean, what I realised when I started... Um, you know, because I was very old. There's hope for everybody, because I was get going till I was 87. And I'm going to be 90 next month. And I, all I can tell you is that I've never had... I, I, I've never had such a marvellous time. I, I'm really enjoying it. I love all the letters I get. I get, because of the sadness of my two boys dying, I get a lot of letters from people who, who've lost children um, and a, a lot of gay letters because of writing about Henry who died of AIDS and the way that he told us and the way. Uh, and and that, that is fantastic. And then, of course, Christopher being in a coma for five months. I, they are really sad, the letters. I got one literally last week, a, a sad lady whose um, son was chopping wood and a piece of wood flew up, hit him on the head and he fell back onto something metal. And the doctors have said he's brain dead, but of course she doesn't, you don't want to believe that. You always think that somehow you're going to um, bring them out of a coma. Uh, and she asked for my advice. And I, I just said, well, I'm going to pray for you. I just really hope. And I, the other thing, because of Christopher, I raised enough money to put into hospitals a coma kit. Because what people find when they have somebody who's in a coma, they don't know what to do. They sort of sit there, you know. And in, I'll tell a story about, I was, after um, my book came out about Christopher, I was contacted by some of a Saudi Arabian family. And their son had had a polo accident. And he was in the London clinic. And would I come 
and look at him, see him. So anyway, I went off and, I mean, before, he was a prince. So before one even got there, the, all these Arabs sitting in the corridor all the way up, I got into his room and there were his mother and sister all in their uh, black, uh, they had black gloves, black, you know. Very bravely I went up and I said, can I take this off you? Because you, you won't be able to help him at all. If you don't, you've got to touch him. Uh, and it's really stimulating the five senses, mm. which is a nice smell, a nasty smell, um, something rather, a, a, a scrubbing brush and something mm. silk. But, but you have to do this regularly. We had to do, I had to do it quarter an hour every hour. And all my friends, I mean, there's two, uh, sisters sitting here, and then they know who they are, uh, and their mother was absolutely, she's called Zana, was absolutely wonderful, and they, they, they signed up and they came regularly, and because of that, I mean, um, we had every sort of doctor looking at Christopher, they came from France, they came from everywhere, because I was desperate, because I knew that the two older boys were dying, and I was just not going to lose Christopher. Um, and uh, uh, the, I remember the one from S Switzerland who came, and he said, oh, Lady Glen Connor, if I were you, I should go home and forget him. You'll never. And that's when I came out fighting. Well, he's been married twice. He's had two wonderful daughters who got first uh, at the King's College. Um, and uh, he's just been to London uh, to meet all his old school friends. I mean, he's, he's badly. Um, disabled. He's never really been able to work. But, but he's a joy. I, I've no doubt he's part of the reason the book has been such a success, that there's so much life experience in there and there's so much depth and so many different themes um, uh, that you talk about in there. I mean, uh, the stories go on, but I would love to get some questions from the audience yeah, yes, because I'm, do, sure, you, there you, are, we'll, we'll I'm sure there are plenty. We do have <laughs> microphones. Um, uh, if anyone would like to ask a question, you're, you're just put well. your hands up. Yeah. Well, there's one over here. Oh, well, Thank you. Oh, well done. Yes. <laughs> oh, yes. I know this guy, but I hate asking questions. Oh, really? <laughs> it's embarrassing. Anyway. Hello. Um, I just wanted to ask Lady Glen Connor what, from a very long and interesting life, what would be the happiest event? Can she select one event that was the most happy thing that happened in what her life? What was the happiest event in your life? Oh, well, there were several. I think having my children, actually, uh, and, and the <laughs> twins, that was one sitting here. Uh, uh, that was lovely. I suppose, um, yes, I said my children have given me more happiness. Sadly, I've lost two. But, um, and, I, well, I mean, looking back at my sort of, um, you know, official life, I suppose being in the coronation was one of the most extraordinary things. I mean, there were just six of us. We were chosen, a rather a sort of snobby thing to say in our day, but we had to be daughters of earls, marquises or dukes. We had to be sort of, uh, had nice figures too. Uh, and of course, there were a lot of jealous mothers who wanted their children. And as my mother said, there's one in particular, a marchioness's daughter. Well, my mother <laughs> said she couldn't have been chosen because she walks as if she's got a cactus bush between her legs. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, not quite the right sort of, you know. Uh, so we were all very carefully chosen. But I, I don't know, I think uh, the happiness, obviously, one's children and the coronation and, and, and my wedding uh, and being, there were moments of joy on Musty because I absolutely love swimming. And in the early days, uh, I mean, it was so wild. It was like, you know, uh, wonderful animals and uh, the, the fish and the coral were so beautiful. I feel very, very lucky to have been there. We were on our own um, for 12 years, Colin and me, uh, sort of, uh, and then, then he started to develop it. I also imagine that selling a million copies of this at 87 was, has been a well, huge source well, of joy. Well, I, I couldn't mean, believe it. It's uh, so the only exciting. thing is, I've got Alexa. Anybody got Alexa here? Well, I don't, well, something very odd about Alexa, because I asked her, and she said, yes, uh, Lady Gokar, you've sold 20 million. I said, no, Alexa, that is absolutely out of the question. So she never came up with a, I don't think, I don't very, I've given her up, really. <laughs> For her inaccuracy. Exactly. Yes. Yes. Well, anyway, so you'll be... Any uh, more questions? No. Anyone brave enough to no, ask no, a question? No, well, obviously... What no. about from your family? No. Uh, uh, oh, there's one there. Yes, over here. Oh, lovely. Thank you, sir. Gentlemen up there. So, uh, my view is that uh, Charles will be the next on the throne, followed by William. What's yours? Sorry, what do you think? Uh, the, the gentleman's view is that Charles will be next on the throne, followed well, yes. by William. 
Uh, of course. I mean, he's the next heir. Uh, and the Queen, I think he'll be a wonderful king. And uh, the Queen obviously wants him to. Um, and he's had a long time, Prince uh, Charles, to sort of get ready for this. Um, I think he's waited longer than anybody else to be king. Um, but no, I think it would be quite wrong if Prince William became king. I think he will in, in, in his turn, you know. What is your perspective on the future of the royal family generally? What, if anything needs to change or Well, it's different. I mean, I just thought endure. during the Jubilee, it was so lovely. Mm. Everybody got together and, you know, it was really it was wonderful. Um, I think, I mean, Prince Charles, I'm a great friend. I, I'm very, very fond of Prince Charles. And I think that he's been so right in, so, in lots of ways. I mean, over climate change, when people laughed at him, you know, and didn't believe him. Uh, and he's been proved right. Um, and Prince William, I don't know as well, but, but he seems very nice. And, and Kate, uh, the Princess, uh, the Duchess of, of um, Cambridge, is, is wonderful. I think we're very, very lucky in having them, I really do. Yes, may, yes, may. my daughter's asked me. <laughs> oh, very good. Well, first of all, Mum, um, well done. That was uh, uh, very eloquent, as always. Um, <laughs> I, I want to know, are you going to be writing another book? <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, well, thank you. Well, it, it's proving a little difficult. The, the thing is, my publishers are desperate because they think the Grim Reaper will arrive any minute now. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll fall off my mortal coil. And so they want to get as much out of me as possible. Uh, and I, what they want, really, is something to follow that. And I think it's going to be called Whatever Next. Mm -hmm. And it's um, a really about how my life has completely changed. I mean, I just am having the best time ever. Um, I can't believe it, you know. I, well, what I... I'm so pleased uh, and humble, really. There's so many people who've liked my book and have f found in it things that re reflect on their lives. Because what I thought originally was that, I mean, a sort of people like me might, you know, might have bought it, but it went right across. I've had letters from people, so I've never read a book since leaving school, but, but your book is the first book I've read. Uh, and I, I, that's very exciting and I'm very humbling. Actually. What was it like when your family first read the book? Well, I didn't dare ring them up. I they, bet. Well, they didn't. I gave them to them and there was nothing. They didn't get in touch. I thought, oh my God. You know, uh, and eventually I said, have you read it? Anyway, one of them said yes, and uh, they liked it. And they also said, which is a slight worry, mm. they said, I think you've been very generous to Dad. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so I felt like, you know, I, 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 no, I mean, you, you yeah, all... I thought it was, I thought it was brilliant. Oh, good, yeah, oh, good. Yeah, and the, the other book I really enjoyed was um, Haunting at Holcombe, because it, it's true, there's one story running through it that's not, but it's my childhood at Holcombe uh, during the war with my grandfather, and we had um, uh, prisoner war camps in the park, and you know the beach was all mined, and, and then uh, that was when my sister and I planned to kill Hitler, because <laughs> well, funnily enough, it was absolutely true. I, I just said it, but I didn't really know that all the Nazi hierarchy had chosen a stately home when they, when they won the war and they were here. Hitler uh, had Blenheim and obviously Buckingham Palace. Goering had Holcombe. And my sister and I were very, very... Uh, we're not allowed to say the word airy any longer, but we were very airy and blonde looking. And we knew Hitler liked that type of looks. Mm -hmm. And so we had Hitler's mess, which was the most disgusting jar we had under our bed. And we were going to, we thought, well, he's bound to come to Holcomb to see Goering. And we were going to say, Mr. Hitler, we've been longing to see you. We've got a special drink for you. And we, we thought we were going to kill him. We didn't think quite was, what was going to happen after no. that. No. <laughs> Did you test it out on anyone? No, well, we weren't mess. allowed to. Our <laughs> governor should have well, well, there we are. Yes, well, there, thank you so much. It, all the success is so well deserved. It's an amazing book, and what a real pleasure to hear from you this afternoon. Thank you so much. I know that everyone's well, we enjoyed it. Lovely, <laughs> Lady Ben Connor. Thank you. <laughs>